I've decided instead to use something a little bit more socially acceptable to flail around. It is an internet aware connected smart knife. So, <laughs> not, it's not just any internet aware connected smart knife. It actually is running the operating system we're going to be talking about today. Um, and every time I change a slide, uh, sorry, all this is open source, by the way. Every time I change a slide, this piece of code is going to be executed. So one of three things is going to happen. I'll talk exactly. Uh, I'll talk later on about exactly what's going on here. But uh, either some kernel state is going to get written to, an array is going to get underrun, or a random register in the system control block is going to be manipulated. And then this thing is going to. Well, every time I change a slide, it's actually recovering and then continuing. Um, so this is the first uh, sacrifice of the demo gods, I guess. This, this thing working. Um, OK. So I'm going to talk about a lot of different things. I'm going to give you a big long list. I'm going to be talking about what memory protection is. I'm going to give you a look at just a really high level overview of what a memory protection unit is, what a memory management unit is, what a system looks like that has no protection at all. I'm going to tell you who, we, who might be interested in memory protection hardware. Um, and then I'm going to move into the Kronos real-time operating system and how we introduced memory protection support into that. And all sorts of other fun stories as well. So um, I might actually switch to my... <laughs> so the capacitive touch sensor on this is really, really sensitive and it's really annoying. Um, but I've already demonstrated that it works, so I might, actually might, I, I might actually switch to this one. So why... <laughs> Isn't that funny that the, that the stupid knife actually works, but this, this one... Oh. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. So why, why memory protection? Well, often you don't have any choice. So if you're using a chip that doesn't have any memory protection unit, uh, or you're in a really cost-constrained situation, you, you don't have any choice. Um, but it's becoming increasingly common, especially in cheap chips, for there to be some basic uh, memory protection functionality. And that's why I think it's interesting to talk about that um, at the moment. So if you don't have any memory protection at all, you can crash your system if, for example, you, OK, let's just take an example. Um, you have, you're writing firmware for some IoT node. There is a task that is for each sensor. You might have a master task that communicates back to a router. Um, and for example, the code that's in one of your sensor tasks could easily just randomly overwrite some code that is in your communication task, or vice versa, or just uh, write into some memory that belongs to the kernel as well. So that's the sort of thing um, that might happen if you don't have memory protection. Now, one thing that could happen is you could crash your embedded system. You would probably think that that's quite bad, and it is bad. But what's worse is if you don't crash the system. Because if you don't crash the system and you randomly overwrite some pieces of memory and it keeps going, some non-deterministic thing is going to happen and you have no idea what your system is going to do. So if we actually take advantage of the memory protection unit that is present on some processes, we can respond deterministically by seeing that a kind of one of your policies has been violated and you can restart your system. Or you could do something else like restart just the offending task. Or you can do something that might sound a bit silly and just ignore the fact that the default occurred. And there is, an actually, there is actually an application for this, which I'm going to talk about later on. All right. So who actually cares? You care? That's good. OK, that, that wasn't intended to be an audience question, but awesome. That's good to see. Uh, <laughs> so this is a result from a survey given every year uh, by uh, an EE news website. And about 1,000 embedded engineers answered this survey. The question was, what are the most important factors in choosing a processor at the moment? Security features. No one cares. I think that's a bit depressing. Next question. What's the most important factor in choosing an operating system? Security fun functionality. No one cares. I think that's pretty depressing. but. If you ask them what will be your next greatest challenges, the third most popular answer is security concerns. So everyone knows there's a problem, but not many people seem to be doing anything about it in this embedded space, which is kind of sad. Um, another thing I want to mention here is 
So the Artos that I'm talking about today is geared probably a little bit more towards functional safety, but you do get some extra security guarantees with what I'm talking about. I just wanted to highlight that if someone wants to hit me up on that later. So three letter acronyms. I hope I haven't used one already. I'm going to be talking about memory protection units, memory protection units. I think I'm saying that really fast. <laughs> uh, memory management units. So just to get an idea, who already knows roughly how a memory management unit works? Okay, maybe about half the audience. So it's probably worth my time to go through this really briefly. Um, so if I have no protection hardware at all on my processor, the CPU pretty much has free reign on the entire address space. That's the simplification. Sometimes you'll get bus faults, but largely that's true. Um, so for example, if I execute some statement, it might not be unreasonable to assume that that's trans translated into a s some assembly, at least that array access, that accesses a particular point in memory, and then this will go straight over to physical memory, look up that address, and just grab whatever value's there. Pretty easy, relatively simple. If instead we have something called a memory protection unit, which is a little bit more sophisticated than having nothing at all, then what we get is uh, a situation where instead of going straight to physical memory, we have this body called the memory protection unit that looks at all of our transactions. Um, from a hardware perspective, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, but basically, what's interesting about the memory protection unit is it has a set of rules. And that set of rules, in a lot of cases, is called a region list. And each one of those regions uh, indicates a particular partition of memory. And each region has a set of permissions as well. So when I perform this uh, 0x2 whatever access, it sits inside that first region you can see there, which has readable and executable permissions. And so that read is going to succeed because the MPU is like, that's OK. And no worries at all. Now, if we take a negative example, we're looking at 0xf instead up there. Um, that does not exist in the region configuration. So the memory protection unit is like, no, you get a nice protection fault. And an interrupt is fired. Depends slightly on what the processor architecture is. But generally, something like that happens. Memory management unit. I want to talk about a memory management unit because that's what you see on your computers that you're probably using now. And again, this is a bit of a gross uh, uh, simplification of what a memory management unit actually looks like, just to give you an idea. A memory management unit actually also has an idea of uh, multiple processes. So if I have a CPU running two different processes, and one of those processes does a request for a particular area of memory, then what I can actually do is, uh, well, that access, in this case, is going to go through another block, different name, MMU instead of MPU. And the MMU has a different set of rules. This set of rules, instead of being called regions, is called translations. And it's a bit more sophisticated, because instead of just blindly checking whether the access is valid, if the access is valid, that is, if 0x20 exists in this translation table, which it does, in column two, you can see this is coming from process two, and it's looking for 0x20. That's that second column. It's got read-write permissions, all good. And that's going to translate to 6a. So this access is actually interpreted by the MMU in physical memory to be at 6a. And that is what goes into R0. And this leads to you making the distinction between virtual memory and physical memory, because from the perspective of process 2 on the CPU, you've accessed this memory address, 0x2, and you've actually gotten 6a. So the view of memory from the, uh, the, the uh, thing that you're executing looks like, your, your memory view looks like this, but your uh, actual situation on physical memory looks like the blue. And this becomes interesting if you have more than one process. So for example, you could have more than one process that actually accesses memory at the same address, but in physical memory, it actually exists in different places. Cool. That, uh, most of you probably already know that, but I wanted to highlight anyway. So if you look at all, uh, all the different properties of these different things, there's a few differences between them. 
So uh, a memory protection unit is obviously a lot better than having no protection at all because you can enforce something. But a memory management unit gives you a little bit more. As far as, for example, complexity and energy usage goes, a memory management unit is a much more complicated piece of hardware. And something else that's interesting in the context of real-time operating systems is that your access times, uh, memory access times with the memory protection units are a bit more deterministic than what they are with memory management units. Um, you, you can put a finite upper bound on how long a memory management unit might take, but it's a bit more difficult to do so. Yeah. So, why might a manufacturer who's building a chip actually put a memory, a memory protection unit in there and not put a memory management unit in there? I mean, I've just talked before about power reasons and uh, silicon area reasons. And exactly how big is the difference? Well, this is an excerpt from uh, a data sheet from uh, an FPGA soft core. So this is basically what it's telling you is these LUTs are numbers that are essentially uh, proportional to transistors on a chip. You can kind of think of it that way. And you can see that a memory management unit to implement that in a Vertex 5 is 910 and an MPU is 560. In reality, I would say that a memory management unit is actually a much more complicated beast than the difference that's indicated here, but probably because the memory protection unit that is implemented in, uh, in the uh, soft core in this case is probably just the memory management unit with bits taken out rather than it being implemented as two separate things, I would say. Okay. So, uh, in this talk, I'm going to be talking specifically about the ARM Cortex M series of microprocessors. And that might be of more interest to you guys as well because that's the same architecture as what the Tomu is based on. So, you all have one. And if you look at all of the different cores in the Cortex M series, here's a rough overview of the features that you'll find. So, the M0 Plus is actually the chip that you'll find on the Tomu. And you've basically what you're looking at here is the M0 under a dollar in volume, probably. The M7, probably around $10 in volume, I would, I would guess. And, and when these, when these uh, you can see how only some of them actually have memory protection units, but they're all optional. So when you buy one of these chips, you really have to look at the data sheet to see whether it even has one. And when, when I say optional in these cases, um, there's also a bit of difference between the actual series. So, for example, the M3, uh, maybe like rough like 40% might have one. M0, maybe 10% might have one. That's just off randomly looking at parts on DigiKey. Um, I don't know what the precise statistics are, but yeah. Those are the differences between some of the different cores. So, how do you actually know whether a chip has a memory protection unit? Often, you can just look at the data sheet, and you would hope that you would always be able to look at the data sheet, but often you can. This is for an STM32L0, which is what's running on the, the knife over there. And you can see that it's got platform security robustness with integrated memory protection unit. Easy peasy. But if we take something cheap from China, much cheaper from China, this is the entire description you get of the, uh, of the processor core in the data sheet. That's it. It integrates a Cortex M3 MCU. There's tons and tons of different <laughs> options and different types of Cortex M3 MCUs, but they do not tell you which specific one it is. So if you want to find out, the way you find out is uh, the way you find out is you can just look at this register. Easy enough. And why am I telling you this? The reason I'm telling you this is because uh, in a number of cases I've actually found. And this is an example with uh, that cheap Chinese thing that doesn't document anything. I've actually found that your really cheap ones, even though they don't document that they have a memory protection unit, they actually do have one. So in this case, I'm inspecting that register. And you can see that the result is 8, 0, 0. And that means that it has a memory protection unit, and it has eight regions in that memory protection unit. So yeah, sometimes there is a memory protection unit on the chip, but it's just not documented. Well, oh, OK. That's normal. <laughs> so normally, your M3s and M4s will have eight regions. 
your M7s might have 16 regions. Each one of those regions actually has uh, a set of permissions, which makes sense. And the way that you set up those regions is that you initialize a register that has a base address for each reason, a region and a size for each region. There's actually some restrictions on what you're able to set those to, but I won't go into those today. Um, but you can look those up if you're interested. Something else that's interesting here is you can set it up so the memory protection unit is only active in user mode, which is something that you would hope exists and makes it a bit easier to use this in a, an operating system situation. And this is just uh, another picture that's showing you what's going on. Um, I've already kind of talked about that. But when I say uh, the Cortex M series usually have eight regions, that's eight entries in this box. So that's cool. I'm going to keep talking about the hardware a little bit because I actually really enjoy this hardware stuff. The M0 Plus, which is what's on the Tomu, the Tomu doesn't actually have a memory protection unit, but any other series, any other chip in the M0 series has an MPU, a memory protection unit that is a little bit dumbed down. So they've taken some features out. For example, the M0 Plus, they take out the memory management, uh, the protection fault interrupt. So if there's a protection fault, you just get a hard fault. Uh, they've taken out the fault address status registers. So if there is a protection fault, you don't know where it came from. And they've taken out the region alias registers, which means that when you load the memory protection unit, uh, it takes you four or five times longer. So this one is a little bit special. And I thought it might be interesting to look at that. OK. You're interested in using a memory protection unit. How are we going to use it? Well, if you look at the open source community, there is a few different options. The ones that I've got here in gray are uh, proprietary operating systems that are not open source that I saw had memory protection support. Um, the ones on the left do have support. The ones on the right don't have support. Probably the most popular one you'll see around is FreeRTOS, which does have memory protection support. Not the easiest. Uh, to, to use, but that's kind of arguable. I'm going to talk about that a bit later. Um, these are not really ordered in terms of popularity, but uh, the top two are probably, you've probably heard of Zephyr as well. Um, yeah. So if you want more information about like which ones of these operating systems are actually the most popular, I've got a link to the survey that lists these at the end of the presentation. Now, a uh, very, very, very brief Ikronos spiel about this operating system. So it's an open source operating system. License recently, recently changed from uh, GPL to a uh, special uh, BSD type license. Um, so it's a little bit more open than it was before. Um, a module of the RTOS scheduler and some other parts have been uh, math mathematically verified. And there's some cool papers about that. And lastly, it is ridiculously tiny and ridiculously fast. That's kind of the end of my Ikronos spiel. <laughs> so with the Ikronos Atos, the focus is really on functional safety and less so on blanket security. And what I mean by that is that we're looking more at the type of application, for example, you might be looking at an airbag controller or a pacemaker or something like that, rather than something like uh, something that's internet connected and it's easy for you to deploy, somehow attack it with malicious software. That's not to say that what I'm talking about today doesn't mitigate those a little bit, but that's just to give you an idea of what this is designed for. So part of the reason why uh, Ikronos has this model is because when you create a firmware image, you already have all the source code for your application. OK. Now, admittedly, some of that source code might be a 20,000 line USB stack that you got from TI, and you don't really know whether it's bug free. Um, but you do have the source code. Yeah. So the goal with what I'm talking about here is we want to make it more difficult to make implementation mistakes. All right. So how do we actually achieve it in this case? Well, basically, what we've done is, by default, set it up so that every task in the system can only access its own stack and code. And you actually get a lot for free by doing that. Because, for example, if you're talking about task kernel isolation, 
if every task can only access its own stack and code, then by definition it can't access any of the kernel state. So you get a lot for free like that. Another thing that's kind of interesting is that we don't actually kind of isolate specific, so the, the stacks are independent um, and each task has their own stack. The, so, the code segments themselves are not kind of individually uh, allocated for each task and permissions set separately for code segments. So the code itself isn't uh, protected, but it is read only, so you can't actually write it. And if you want more information about that, and if that sounds a little bit strange to you, um, there is a paper on it called Safer Sloth, and there's also, it, it's like an industry standard used in automotive applications, and there's all sorts of um, literature around that. Um, I can talk about that at the end if you're interested. So, the problem is if you give a task only access to its own stack, <laughs> it's pretty useless. I mean, it can make system calls, but you really want to be able to do something else. So how are we actually going to give extra pieces of memory to each one of these tasks? Well, in our case, uh, we use something called protection domains. Now, this is, this is actually uh, slightly different to the implementation that you might see in other RTOSs. Um, and I think it's pretty cool, so I'm going to explain what it is. Basically, what a protection domain is, is it's a way of naming a blob of memory. Pretty simple. And here's an example. So at the top there, we have uh, the GPIO, dev GPIO device. That, for example, that might be some memory mapped um, GPIO peripheral. Uh, and then I've just declared that as part of some domain, conceptual domain. And then after I've created these different domains, so one of them might contain some peripherals, one of them might contain some global state, something like that. We can then start to associate tasks with those protection domains. So in this case, um, I've associated task A there with read-write read write permissions to the top two domains, and then task B has read-only permissions to domain B, and so you can give different um, domains to each task to set up what your permission model actually is supposed to look like. All right. Now, if we take a simpler example, uh, the reason I'm giving you this simpler example is because now we have a case with a task that doesn't have any permissions or any associations with protection domains at all. And that's interesting because if we actually start looking at what this situation looks like uh, at a hardware perspective, what's going well, uh, sorry, at an application perspective, here's what's actually going on. And please don't be scared like this. I know it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a scary diagram. Uh, don't be scared. So, uh, task A. Task A. If we have a look at task A, task A has read/write permissions to this particular UART domain. So, in this perspective, the the Ekranos kernel has selected task A, indicated by that green arrow at the bottom, and it is associated, indicated by the association box on the bottom left. Uh, uh, that's just some uh, piece of memory in the kernel. It, it selected that particular set of associations, which means that task A has read-write permissions to the UART domain, as you can see up there, and it also has access to its code segment on the left and the stack of task A on the right. Pretty simple. If we start to switch between different tasks, so we could switch to task B, it will select well, it will context switch and it will select a different set of protection regions using the memory protection unit. And I can go back and forth. That's what's going to happen when we start switching between these tasks. So interestingly, task C here does not have access to any uh, protection domains. So if we switch over to task C here, it is only able to access those two regions, which makes sense. It's got no associations. All right, now I'm going to try and give you a demo. This is going to be interesting. So the situation here is this demo is about trying to sandbox, in some respect, a manufacturer's USB driver. So uh, the demo is I'm going to be basically, uh, 
What's an easy way to explain this? <laughs> so I've got two USB ports basically, two USB ports going into my little development board, which looks like, uh, <laughs> I forgot that. it looks like this. So there's two USB ports. One of them I'm going to use to send commands to it using an emulated uh, USB serial device, and that's going to be running the manufacturer's USB stack. Um, the other one I'm going to be using for JTAG so that I can inspect whether there's any protection faults and see what's happening. How is this actually structured? So if we look at the code from a block diagram perspective, we have a couple of tasks to do with the USB driver, and they have access to the USB driver state, which is a protection domain that contains some named areas of memory. We have a console server that has a circular buffer so that the uh, USB server, which is emulating that USB serial device, can actually communicate to a server through that one buffer. At this point, there is no way that the console server can somehow manipulate the memory that's in the USB driver state. And there's no way, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, I already said that. And another thing we have here is, so the console server is going to go through some LED state to talk to the RGB LED server so that we can twiddle some LEDs. And additionally, I also have a serial port server set up so that uh, the console server can accept USB commands and then spit things out over the native UART. That's not the USB emulated UART. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions about this demo? Because that might have been, I hope that was interpreted reasonably well. Maybe it'll be better for me to give you a demonstration and then, uh, and then we can get into that. All right. Um, so this is going to be interesting. So I've just plugged in the JTAG port and now I'm going to plug in the USB serial emulation port. And then if I go ahead and start up OpenOCD, this is connecting to the board, the connecting the debugger to the board. And then I'm going to flash uh, my USB demo image. Something else that's interesting to note here is that when I create protection domains, um, it automatically creates these linker se segments that you can see there, worth pointing out. Um, and I'll go into that in detail a little bit later. The other thing I want to do is that's actually ah okay <laughs> no, okay I've, I've hit a break point on main so it actually hasn't actually initialized the USB stack yet. Um, so if I actually do initialize the USB stack, uh, there we go. Uh, there we go. So now we're talking to this development board uh, through an emulated USB serial device, and we can do a bunch of stuff. For example, if I go LED on, this is not something you'll see on video, but it's turned the LED on. Yay! But it has gone through that entire network of tasks that I showed you before. I can turn, if, if I leave the LED on, I can do demo peripheral. And I've gotten a protection fault. It's detected that I've tried to access the LED peripheral from the console task. And obviously, the console task has no permission to get to the LED peripheral, so that's failed. I can do other stuff like try and access some data in the kernel. And I don't have any ability to do backspace on this terminal, so that's why I'm doing that weird stuff. OK, another protection fault. Um, and I can also do fun stuff like because, because at, at the moment the fault behavior is skipping faulting instructions because it's in debug mode, normally you would just reboot the device if you get a protection fault. Um, if I do something like try and cause an infinite uh, recursive loop, uh, demo stack, it'll just constantly protection fault because it's just skipping the instruction and it's like in a while loop that can never finish. But normally, uh, if you're setting up a system like this, you would make the system reboot. OK. I'm actually pretty happy that worked. 
Uh, oh, that's my recording of it in case it didn't work. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So when you're creating a protection domain uh, using the build system, you can create what's called an address domain, which is for memory mapped I.O. and peripherals, that sort of thing. Or you can create a symbol domain, which contains like your global variables, for example, your just random arrays, that sort of thing. And what these declarations look like, well, if I'm creating a protection domain for a peripheral, it might look something like this. I give it the base address and the domain size. Um, if I'm doing something that is uh, just a region of memory that contains some globals, I can add symbols, which are pulled in using the linker. And you can also do stuff like annotate an entire object file instead of just a particular symbol. And that's how you can create protection domains using this. Um, there's a lot that goes on under the hood to make this possible. So when you've created some protection domains, you can use them in your tasks just by adding an associated domains field to your task and then give each domain a permission. So for example, the first domain there is not given any permission indica indications there, which means that it is read only. If you didn't have that domain annotation there at all, it wouldn't have permissions at all. Um, so this kind of continues the tradition of having to opt in to get any memory permissions at all. Um, and of course, there's writable, executable, that sort of stuff as well. So, yes? So what you just showed us is some sort of configuration for the R talk? Yeah, so that's exactly right. Um, so I didn't want to go into too much detail about how precisely the build system works. But essentially, when you create a, an RTOS system, you have your C implementation, which is uh, your source. Um, but you also have this XML formatted configuration file, which is what I'm showing you here, that is kind of, they're all kind of munched together and then give you a firmware blob at the end. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. I, I want, yeah. Okay. Um, right. System calls. This is an interesting, interesting topic because basically, um, so because Ekronos is a library RTOS rather than your conventionally, 10 minutes, okay, thanks. Um, instead of like your mode switching operating system, um, basically when you make a, a system call in big quotation marks, because it's not really a system call with a library RTOS, uh, what's happening is it's just exactly the same as a function call. So it looks like this. Now, if uh, we were to use these um, protection domains, set up the memory protection unit exactly the way that I'm talking about, um, and we were just to make a system call like this, obviously this would not work, because if we did do this, then we would just uh, be trying to manipulate some kernel state when we're actually inside a task, and we would, we would cause a protection fault in that task. So the way that we actually did mode switching in our RTOS is we use something called inline traps. So uh, what is an inline trap? It is something that at first glance looks like not such a good solution, but when you think about the situation that Ekronos is designed for, that is when you have all the source code when you create your system, actually does make some sense. So all that an inline trap is it's, quite, it, it, it's not uh, too complicated. It's basically when you make a system call, the processor will issue a supervisor call and just elevate itself into privilege mode. Um, then it will return back to that same region. Yeah, so that same segment. It's, OK, I'll start again. Um, so you're executing some code in the task. You make a system call. That system, that system call might be inlined. It might be somewhere else. Processor causes an exception, SVC. It returns straight back to where it was before, but now it actually has permissions, whereas before it didn't. So just by the act, of, uh, the act of making that SVC, it now has permissions. We don't have a system call lookup table or anything like that. It's just that if you make this SVC, you now have permissions. And then after the system call completes execution, a drop privileges function is called, and then we've got no permissions, and then we can continue executing code in the task. 
is this a security vulnerability? It would be if we didn't have all of the code w w before we started, like trying, or when we created our application. So you can use binary analysis tools to make sure that this protocol isn't being violated. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> this is this is a bit interesting. So. Um, QMU actually didn't have support for memory protection units until maybe six months ago. Um, and at the moment, it's, it's kind of partial support. Um, but one of the problems we had is how do you actually check that the memory protection hardware is set up uh, as, well as, uh, as well as possible? And when I say as well as possible, what I mean is we don't want to just inspect that the memory protection unit registers are set up properly. We want to check at a hardware level if we violate uh, our protection policies at any point in the code, we want to know whether that is going to be a problem. And why is this a problem? Well, if you're trying to do regression tests and you want to assert that you will, you will um, cause a protection fault at any point in the code, you will, you will basically crash the system at the first fault in the code and then you will just not continue executing because that's just you're taking a hard fault or something like that. So this basically meant that, um, oh, and here's an example. So this is from one of our tests. Uh, it will just do something that should cause a, cause a protection fault, do something else that should cause a protection fault, do something else that should cause a protection fault. And obviously, normally on hardware, um, the first one would just crash the system and there's no way for you to test anything after that. Um, so the way, that we fix this is probably the ugliest function I've ever written. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of um, that Python module, but it's basically like that, but for microprocessors. It will take a protection fault, or even a hard fault, and it will just ignore the fact that it happened, register that it did happen, and return back to the code as if nothing happened. So if you were to deploy this in any real system, that would be terrible, terrible, but for regression tests, it's perfect in our situation. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to give you an example. Of, oh, actually, I have a recording of this one. Yeah, okay. So just running QMU, running one of the tests. And something interesting I want to show you here is that um, some of these things, so in QMU, there are some protection faults. But some of them don't fault. And that's because I've specifically set up a pathological example in this case. If you make your uh, memory protection regions less than 1K in size, it will, the, the, the behavior will actually differ between what you get on QMU and what you get on the actual hardware. Because the hardware supports down to 32 byte uh, sizes of regions, whereas QMU does, does not. Um, so that's something that I'm working on fixing at the moment. But I thought that might just be useful. So, um, sloth is kind of regarded in some academic circles as one of the fastest RTOSs around. Here are some really, really rough non-paper type numbers that I did in a weekend. Uh, what's interesting is that we're definitely close to sloth in terms of context switch and like system call mode switch times. Um, but as far as actually uh, reconfigure the, reconfiguring the memory protection unit, that is, every time you context switch, you have to change the list of regions in the memory protection unit, we're actually a lot faster. And I'm not exactly sure what the sloth guys are doing, but the code isn't open, so I don't know. OK. Um, cool stuff. So if you want to run the Ikronos Artos on your Tomu, you can. I don't know, I was hacking away on Monday and got that working. Um, and another cool thing that's, that's coming soon is that we actually have uh, integration for libopencm3. So one of the complaints, you could say, with the Ekronos RTOS is that it doesn't have driver support. But libopencm3 is a massive repository of drivers for chips um, that you can get, and we're working on supporting that. So um, that's what I talked about. I'll go back to that slide in one second. Um, but these are the links, so I'll leave the links up for like one minute and then I'll go back to that slide. So thanks everyone for listening.
Uh, we have time for two questions. Maybe. Maybe. Um, okay. So stick your hand up if you're interested. And Seb, I'll ask you to restate the question when, when it's asked. Sure. If it's asked. Yep. Yes. Right, okay, so that would be another thing for me to add to the RTOSs table, or are you saying that it's the implementation is like exactly the same? Um, it, I, I've written a presentation on it, not the paper, and it seems to be doing a lot, a lot of similar things like swapping uh, FPU regions in the in every switch class. And they got something to try and uh, reduce heap memory fragmentation as well. Oh, that's cool, yeah. yeah. Um, Pretty much every implementation of uh, memory protection unit support does do that context switching of memory protection unit regions. Um, some of them don't, but this is a bit different to some of the other stuff out there from what I've seen. Yeah, yeah I haven't heard of it. I, I might, add, well, if I ever give it again, I'll add, I'll add it to the table. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Peter. Restate the question, please. <laughs> what were the most difficult parts about doing this? Um, uh, hardware is hard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Data sheets are wrong sometimes. Um, yeah, that's probably most of the answer to my question. And, may, and trying to find, come up with a design that would be uh, that really tailored to what the purpose of the art horse was for was difficult. Yes? How many people work on this problem and how is it going to be more broadly? Um, so, I, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to say. The question was? Oh, the question was um, how many people work on the RTOS and where is it deployed? Um, so, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to say where it's deployed, but it is. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, but uh, as for the amount of people, it kind of. Like, people that have made major contributions over the last few years, probably maybe six to seven people, and people that kind of work on it at the moment, three or four, would be about what we're looking at. Yeah. That's yes. all the... Oh, okay. oh, if you're fast. Okay. Um, how's the FPU interaction on these things with the core coupled memory? Is it just treated like any other RAM the same, and the region the same, or is it different? As far as I and know... the question it, is... And the question is... How does the memory protection unit interact with the core coupled memory on some of these cores? Because some of them have, like, you mean the tightly coupled memory? Yeah. 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 Um, so I would have to read a data sheet to give you a definitive answer, but I believe it's just like any other memory region. Yeah. Awesome. That's all the time we have. Um, join me once more in thanking Seb for his awesome talk. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks,